Hello and welcome, everyone, to a beautiful day in the world of tone. Today is an amazing day in Tone Town, I must say. We have the great <laughs> Justin Ostrander here with us, the pride of Nashville, one of the great session guitarists in town, and we're going to be talking to him about all things related to gear, playing sessions, maybe some tips and tricks to break into the scene, if that's something that you're considering, moving to Nashville and becoming a guitar slinger. Welcome, Justin Ostrander. Hey, thanks for having me. This is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, welcome, absolutely. welcome. So the, the first question that I have for you, Justin, uh, and I should first uh, preface this with, Justin has an amazing YouTube channel, and I really love to see guys in his position where they are professionals that are making their living playing on, as, as Justin puts it, songs in Nashville, um, <laughs> that he gives you this inside look as to, you know, his thought process, his development, even some cool videos on analyzing other people's recordings that have submitted them to him. And he gives them his tips as to how, you know, it can be altered to kind of make it, you know, more in alignment with, you know, what the expectations are that are put in front of him by producers and engineers and I think it's just a really amazing resource for guitar players just in general. And you get to hear a guy who can really play the guitar as well. So that's a, that's a bonus. So definitely do check out Justin's channel. We will have that in the show notes and in the description so that you can see that. But Justin, my first question is, uh, as, as somebody who is always refining and, and, and building different pedal boards, I've been in the process of building what I consider to be sort of a Nashville staple pedal board just to see that if I put all the Nashville staples on a pedal board, will I actually sound like one of the great Nashville session musicians like a Justin Ostrander or a Derek Wells or a Tom Bukovac? If you were to say to somebody who is building a pedal board and let's just say has somehow gotten their way into the session scene, can you think of like, what would you say are the core elements on a rig that you would need to have based on your experience in terms of, of, of pedals? Whew. So, <clears throat> so the entire board. Yeah. Let's, let's just build this thing from the ground up. Money is no object. What, what are the things that you feel like <laughs> are staples that you're going to need for a Nashville session? Okay. So, um, I talk a lot on my channel about how I run my amps, first of all, and, uh, um, we'll get to those me, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this, this informs the way that I, okay. that I set up all my pedal boards. So, um, basically I run through an amp that is on the edge of breakup almost always. And I like being able to hit the strings hard and have all that swirl around the note, but also to be able to back off and have something that, um, as Tim Pierce puts it, reads clean. It's not dead clean, but in a mix you, you're hearing a clean, you know, a, a hairy clean, I guess. Yeah. Um, so with that said, my pedals, you know, as far as overdrives and stuff go, um, they're, I use them to sort of push the front end of the amp. I'm not looking for a big volume jump. Um, I'm looking for um, something that's going to kind of melt with the amp itself and and sort of work together, you know. So for me, like on the board that I've been carrying around the most, um, my two overdrives, I've been using a Jackson Audio Golden Boy because I'm a really big fan of the Blues Breaker circuit. And uh, that pedal in particular is really cool. It has an independent boost. Um, there's a bit of a learning curve. I kept wanting to step on both switches <laughs> at the same time to, to get drive and boost, and then it would go into some mode, you know? of like selecting gain levels and everything. And I, I've figured it out. I've, I've learned it, but that was, that was hard. And then of course, I mean, you have to have, I think it's almost a requirement. You know, you might get a ticket if you show up to a session without some flavor of a nobles <laughs> <laughs> ODR, you know, yeah. you can get written up tone police. Um, <laughs> so with my pedal, with my pedal board, like usually the first, the first pedal is a fuzz 
And for some reason, for the longest time, I've been stuck on the original old um, Morgan. Uh, I think he originally called it a Shadow Fuzz. Yeah. You know? That, that pedal just sort of erupts in a way that I really like. And it's got a bit of that sag to it. If you hit it with really hard pickups, it brings in this octave down frequency on the lower strings. I can really get it with my gold top. It's super cool. But I go from that into the Golden Boy, into the uh, ODR-C. I'm playing a Nordland. Um, okay is what's on my board. Nice. But I did just get the new Keeley pedal that I really like. They they Screamer. gave me one of those and uh, the Noble Screamer. Yeah, that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I go from that into a volume pedal. I all of my overdrives in front of the volume pedal, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then after the volume pedal, I have a GE7. That's almost a requirement too. I'm probably going to do a video about that pedal because I think it's the most useful pedal that almost no one steps on very often, <laughs> you know? Um, and then from that, you really have to have some preset um, go-to things as far as your modulation and delays and reverbs. And I'm using the Natchex effects, you know? I think that it... It's very intuitive. Um, it sounds a lot better than the older M series stuff. And you know, there's incredible players that are still running the M series pedals, and and you know, that's fine. I just, I just thought that with the HX Line Six sort of brought the audio quality and the conversion and the just the just the quality up to like an eventide level. You know, mm -hmm. so I have that as well. I have the eventide H nine and i have a little dunlop echoplex pedal um and then all three of those are being tempo controlled by a mini um smart clock um, the disaster area yes yes Very so cool. if i find out whatever the bpm of the song is i just i reach down and dial that knob but i can also tap it if i want and uh the way that I run those three pedals, the HX, the H9, and the um, the Echoplex pedal, is that the, the Echoplex and the H9 are inside the HX. They're loops. Mm -hmm. So whatever, whatever pedal board scene I'm on on the HX, those pedals, Echoplex, then H9, they come after my last delay on the HX and before my first reverb. So whatever the scene is, whatever I have as those six presets, those two pedals are in in that chain in those spots. Mm. And yeah, I feel like I feel like a couple of good overdrives, you know. A good a good amp is always key. I'm a big fan of of just a great sounding amp. Like pedals to me aren't going to fix <laughs> something that you don't like about the way your guitar sounds straight into the amp. It's there to enhance and to push the amp, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I just sort of ride that line on the edge of breakup and, and I can get good mix levels with my delays and reverbs and they don't overpower everything. A lot of people who watch my channel, like they'll, they'll comment on the fact that you really hear all this space and repeats and whatever when I'm just showing them what my tone is, but then when the track is going, that stuff isn't quite as apparent. And that's the whole thing. It's it's like you'd miss it if it wasn't there. It's it's creating space and giving you this image of where your guitar sits in the entire mix, but it's not overpowering. I'm not over committing whoever's going to mix that to my effects levels, you know. Yeah. That that's a big consideration. Is for my you, in in do you ever run any of these effects in effects loops or after the the mic or, or stuff like that, or is it always in front of the amp typically? Man, the sound these days is just all of it in the front of the amp. Yeah. And I did a video where I demonstrate how well that can work. Um, I did a video on a, like my three favorite settings for a Tweed Deluxe, right? For mm -hmm. like a 5E3 circuit. And... I have the amp 
pretty well dimed. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm using the guitar volume controls to get a cleaner sound. Well, then I step on a reverb pedal, a Maris Mercury 7, which is one of my favorite reverbs. Um, I, the plate on that is so good. Um, and, you know, you, the, the conventional logic is that you're going to run into all sorts of issues. Running, running modulation, running delays, like your repeats are going to be too, way too loud in a, into a cranked dirty amp. Your reverb mix is going to sound weird going into a distorted signal. Um, and man, there, there's, a, there's a spot on there where I show like, look, if you back things off with the guitar and you clean up the, clean up the signal you're sending into the amp, it really can work, you know? I've, I've never used an effects loop. I think that was just way before my time. I've always been a combo amp guy with a pedal board. And, you know, if I'm doing any effects, they're, they're on the mic. They're coming <laughs> out of the speaker. Yeah. Uh, very rarely I'll put, I'll put a very subtle stereo verb on, on a part as a suggestion, you know, um, that stuff in Nashville, when you're playing on songs, that's, more the engineer's purview, the mix engineer. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to, again, I don't want to commit and, and make his process or her process more difficult because they're hearing this. They, they've got this way that they like to use reverbs and, and some delays to, to really make everything pop. And then I've already got this like ultra reverb drenched part or something. So yeah. again, just subtlety it's it's all about subtlety to me in when you deliver most parts are they almost always in mono or how often are you able to deliver a stereo track that's let's say two amps or something like that man i can count on one hand hmm. the number of times i've run a stereo rig on a session <laughs> it's yeah. just it's just you know like I don't you know. You hear that, maybe everybody? That's... You hear that, all you stereo perverts? <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't listen. Don't listen to him. Uh, <laughs> would that be the same live as in sessions? Like if you were going out on tour, because I know you you mentioned the channel, you you toured for something like six years, sounded like pretty well straight. Would you mm -hmm. also run mono there, or would there ever be a scenario live where that differs? No, I totally ran stereo live. Okay, so sessions yeah. and stereos are uh, uh, sessions versus live sorry are different beasts in that regard like your rig could drastically change potentially depending on the live gig right yeah so with, with my live gig i was the only electric guitar player um and it was my job to take all the parts off the record this is the reverse of what i do now it was my job to take all the parts off the record throughout the entire song pick out, okay, what's most important in the intro? I got to grab that. What's most important in the verse? In the first verse, it's usually me not playing, you know? Then I got to grab the most important chorus part. And, and so I piece together a single live part based on whatever is the most important. And sometimes, you know, I'm playing this chorus part off the record and the artist is like, man, I really just want big chords. Can you do that? Okay, great. So because there's only one electric guitar on on almost all of the gigs I had. I, I was on a, the Sarah Evans gig for a while and there was another electric guy on that. But, you know, it was just, it was my job to fill things out. And even the way I would play lead sections, you know, sometimes it was a line with a droning open string. You know, you, you go for bandwidth <laughs> as the only guy. And so... My rig for the last like three years of touring, I had a Princeton Reverb and a Morgan <laughs> JO12. <laughs> um, I talked to Joe about wanting to run something like Mike Campbell would do, where he'd have a, a Princeton and a Tweed, yep. you know, and he would blend the sound of them. My problem was I wanted to do that, but I wanted them to be left and right of a stereo mix. And since I was coming out of pedals that are putting delays and reverbs into it, well, the front end of a, of a 60s Princeton 
compresses a lot differently than the front end of a 5e3 and so using the speakers old, on their own on those amps <laughs> right yeah yeah that's a big part of it too is the speaker yeah. you'd get real lopsided effects you know like the the mix level because of the way the tweed compresses is totally different so i told i told joe my problem i was like i need i need a tweed amp that responds to um you know delays reverbs boost pedals whatever kind of like my Princeton reverb. And he's like, oh, I got just the thing. And he sent it to me and we made a couple tweaks and that was that was my rig. So I did a Mike Campbell-ish, you know, with with the with all the stereo effects and things to create just a really big, big sound. I think when you're the only guy, the only electric guitar player, um, it makes a lot of sense. On sessions, I'm never the only guy. Yeah. even if i'm just the, sorry you go you keep going justin oh i was just gonna say even if i'm the only electric player on the session i'm stacking multiple tracks yeah. so i have to think like somebody who's playing with another guitar player i love one of the things you you've just mentioned and also mentioned on your your youtube channel and i feel like this is where uh i have a lot of areas where i'm a weak very weak guitar player i don't consider myself a great guitar player at all and I notice this especially, and I would love to get your perspective on this, is I feel like where I am a weak and I see a lot of weakness in other guitar players is the need to always play. Like I always <laughs> have to play something because I have a yeah. guitar in my hands and, and sometimes I'm the only guitar player and I feel the need like I got to fill this space. But the, the thing I appreciate about great guitar players, especially if you're talking in country, and in Nashville is they know how to stop playing their instrument and leave space and take a breath as you, you kind of phrase in, in solos and stuff like that. And the ability to know and to have the skill when you can shred a million miles a minute, but to be able to just stop and then really put focus maybe on the downbeat of the, the next chorus. It's like my notes will stick out and be more valuable if I stop now and wait until the the downbeat of the next session next section sorry whatever it might be can you can you speak to that because you're even saying in the live example in the first verse you often wouldn't play and you're still you're the only guitar player so how do you right how do you balance that how have you learned over the the years of playing and the years of uh, gigs that you've done to when it's a good idea to stop playing versus when you really are needed and need to add something yeah, that's a that's a really great question and that's something that I I deal with song to song. Like my job, everybody's job on the session or in the band is to make the song translate. And the biggest component of that is what what is the dynamic shape that the song needs to have, right? Like not only like we, we have to decide is the intro big are we all up and then we tighten up for the verse how long is it from the intro to the chorus you know so if there's like a double first verse then you've got to build that time that it takes you to get to the chorus you know like say you have a big intro long double verse and then everybody's back in on the chorus well that verse needs to be broken up into how people are going to enter right mm -hmm. and the big joke that i always toss out it's kind of passive aggressive, I guess, because sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you're in there with a with an artist that's like, "Man, I like that. Do that more. We need to do that more. We need to we need to another chorus, you know." And I'll, I'll get on the talk back. I'm like, "Yeah, man, let's leave them wanting less." Ooh. And you know, <laughs> and they always they kind of stop for a second. They're like, "Yeah," uh. and you know, like that can be kind of depending on how you deliver it that can be kind of a, a jerky thing to say, but it's also making a valid point. Like we don't want to fatigue people. We want the song yeah. to be over and people to be like, man, I love that. We don't want them to be thinking about what the, they're ready to move on by the time <laughs> you're, all, you're still singing the chorus hook over a long outro. And it's like, no one likes this as much as you do, man. <laughs> <You> <laughs> so it really, it, it just comes down to the shape of a song. And I can, I can make things more impactful by reducing the amount of space I occupy, you know, like 
the intro, maybe, man, I came up with such a cool part. Well, it's not about me and the part that I came up with. By the time we get to the turnaround, yeah, you know, we, we want to get back into the second verse. We want to feel, we want to feel backbeat. We want to feel the band driving verse two into a second chorus that has even maybe a slightly bigger gear shift from the first chorus, right? And so maybe that turnaround needs to be half as long. Well, it's not about me. <laughs> I can play my part in that turnaround for that half half as as long as as what I did in the intro. And you know, it it's I I think end of the day it comes down to the shape of the song and how we build that, how we retain interest, how we make the lyric most impactful from the start to the finish. So Love it. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Any any other questions, Brian or Grant, about pedal board gear before we move on? Oh yeah, yeah, pedal boards. I do um, have one, I, but I'll yeah. let Brian go. <laughs> yeah, I I did. So because I was I was scrolling through your your channel and your social media, and I saw. Do you have a separate studio board versus a live board? Like, do you? Uh, I know I've seen some guys like this is my only like I actually built a ri a rig for a guy who's like this lives in my studio, and it was like, <coughs> excuse me, it was like forty by twenty, and it had all, everything <laughs> you could think of like the kitchen sink and its brother, like it had literally yeah. everything, and yeah. um, I've seen people go like yeah this is what I this is what I need for this session or to do this session, but then like you'll go and see other guys where they like, um. Um, they'll have just like a tiny board and, or they'll have really basic, really minimal stuff. And I'm like, that's how you get through like a live set. He's like, yeah, this is all I need. I just need the staples. Um, so I'm curious, do you have two separate boards or do you typically use one board for everything? I've got three boards. Okay. Very cool. So, Very cool. um, the, the biggest one is at my feet right here. It, it lives at home. I've got big vintage pedals on it and um I love this board. I I've gone through it. I've done a video on the two boards that I use for recording. So those are some of the more popular videos on my channel. If if people go to my channel and and search by popular, they're going to be in the first few rows of of the results. Um so this one just has a ton of options. It has an old CE1 on it. It has a, a Voodoo Vibe on it, which is one of my favorite tremolo pedals, by the way. Just yeah, I, th the, I think Michael Landau too is is a uses it for tremolo and a, and yeah. after all the d drives and stuff like that. So not ordinarily where you might find a Univibe on a pedal board. Yeah, exactly. That's really cool. Mine mine's in front, but I still in front of the drives. But I I do just love the tremolo on. It's gorgeous on that pedal. Is, is and this then I the have board? The, Sorry, I was just say, is this no, the board ahead. that has the timeline and the Mobius? Yes, sir. Uh, on yeah. It? Okay, cool. Yes. I saw that from a uh, five yeah. months ago. Yeah, exactly. Um, Very cool. Yeah, so that's that's the big one. That basically stays here. Does and that then, have a memory man too, Justin? It doesn't. No. Um, the other delay pedal on this is about the earliest DM2 that I could find. Yeah. The original wow. Boss Black Label uh, yeah, DM2. With, the, with the Panasonic MN3005 chip. Very common, Boom. easy to come by, and affordable, I've heard about the original <laughs> DM2. I think it's the <laughs> highest priced pedal per max delay time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> if you pay per millisecond. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. But yeah. man, just the space that it makes around a note and the sounds, like, I'll use it with... And you got to be really careful about where you put the knobs, but I'll use it with a really short delay, really high repeats, and use it as almost a reverb. It's it's the repeats are so close together, and the delay time it, it kind of ends up being a pad. And yeah. I've done that on several videos on my channel. Um, the board that I carry around is the one that I described at the beginning of of our our chat here with the the HX, the H9, and the um, very cool. Dunlop Echoplex pedal, and there's a there's a video about that on my channel as well. And then live, man, I try to get away with as little as possible live. I mean, unless there's parts that 
that require some delay or, or whatever, I will go play a cranked Princeton reverb with a fuzz pedal and just my little re- reverb and tremolo foot switch. And I will go for a broke on that. And yeah. I've had so many guitar players, like when there's, when there's a gig where there's a bunch of artists in a row or whatever, you know, I don't, I don't do this stuff very much anymore, but <laughs> I would go out there with a telly, a Princeton reverb and my little Morgan fuzz pedal. And these guys would look at my rig and they'd hear me play. And then they'd look at their like, you know, space <laughs> control center, like mission, like just giant, like the pedal board's so big, like how'd you fit that in your car? <laughs> you yeah. know? Right. I'm like, Oh man, what am I doing? You know, it was the re- response I would get often, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> Cause yeah. like for me, it's man, it's, it's like, I went through that whole phase where the board just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I had literally every option ever. And then I started treating the way that I play, the way everybody started treating music when they had 10,000 songs on their iPod. It's like, what do I listen to now? It's like option overload, you know? Yeah. And so I, I talk about this a lot, like restrict all those choices, take that away, get back to just the music, you know? Let your pickups actually see the input of the amp, you know, with without a bunch of other things in the way and see what comes out. It's different, you know, like you you will be inspired by not hearing the same old thing that you do, because, you know, when you hear a song at this tempo with this feel like, oh, I know I need that reverb, that delay, that boost, you know, I'm going to be on this pickup setting or whatever. And you just get in these ruts. Um in, in so many different ways. And one of the ways for me was, was by just relying on a giant pedal board. So I was like, screw yeah. it. You know? Yeah. One more little bit about that. I, I did the first couple sessions I did with JT Kornfloss, which if you guys don't know him, you know, he was, he was yeah. the sweetest, most gentle, very unassuming guy. And he sounded like, a dragon like on the guitar like just the biggest tone and he would use almost nothing like the only pedal that he regularly used on his tiny board on sessions was a tuner you know and he just was so musical and you think you think oh man he's the guy that shoots from the hip and plays like raunchy rock telly rhythm stuff and yeah that's true but man when when it calls for something else, he'll go there. And it's always about the musicality. It was never like, well, I've, I've got this Strymon setting for for this kind of song or whatever, you know? And I yeah. was so inspired by the way he played that I stopped bringing a pedal board to sessions for a while. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. It started freaking people out a little bit. They're like, how are you going to get your sound? You know, I'm like, man, it's going to be great. Don't worry about yeah. it. <laughs> well, I had a, a... Go for it, Brian. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just no, saying, I have uh, I have a friend uh, from years ago. I worked for um, the amp company Jackson Amp Works over here in Dallas. Oh yeah, and yeah. yeah so I know Brad of them, uh, and I'm good for. Uh, oh, I know I'm friends with. Uh, you may know him because he's in Nashville. Justin Weaver. He's a good oh, friend man. of Brad. Justin's I great. Hate that guy. And that guy's he, so. <laughs> he he's incredible. And like I the love first him. time, yeah, uh, the, he's one of the my first best, time I met, best friends in town. Yeah. He's great, and the first time I met him, like I had come, I come from like the worship background, so like you know, pedals galore. Yeah. There's all sorts of all, right more more reverbs, more blessing, as as some of these people say. <laughs> and um, <laughs> um, kid you not, I had a guy who had two big skies, and I was like, "Why did you have two big skies?" He's like, "Layers, bro." I'm like, "Okay, yeah." So <laughs> two is but, one, um, one is none, <laughs> right? But when I met Justin, coming from having a, a large board, he like he would play with like bare minimum and i it literally made me like change my perspective on like okay like maybe i don't need seven overdrives maybe i don't need multiple delays and it's great to have that kind right. of stuff and to utilize that stuff but like i like after that nam like the first name i went to when i met him i like shrunk my board down and it was like 
it was so much easier to focus on playing and there's less things I have to worry about and there's less weight. And I was only 20 at the time. So like, I was like, Oh, I'm a young kid. I can carry on these boards, but throwing something <laughs> compact on your backpack on your back was super cool. But yeah, he's a monster player. After meeting him, I was like hearing him play through just a, an acoustic I can't even imagine what he plays to as an electric, right. and then I heard him, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, I'm I'm, right. I'm done, guys." But yeah, no, I I like that. I think my the, f- the thing that I love uh, about all this as well, and I'd I'd be curious if you agree, Justin. But I I feel like with guitar playing, whenever I've shrunk my board and life in general, if I can go that broad, uh, creativity thrives with limitations. And I feel like if you have a, you know, you're used to playing with 10 pedals, uh, reverbs, delays, overdrives, all sorts of different things, multi effects, and you give yourself a four pedal minimum, no multi effects allowed, and you have to play the same gigs or you have to play the same sessions, you will figure out how to get there, but you might have to learn a new technique. You might have to change your amp settings. You might have to, you know, switch up your signal chain. Like you have to get creative. And I feel like, uh, limiting yourself on purpose only makes you a better musician because everything has to shift to get a better end result. And uh, I, I feel like my best uh, leaps forward in guitar has when I've had is when I've had significant limitations that I've put on myself. And often for me, that's drastically changing my board to be tiny. Uh, and I always love the results, and I enjoy playing more. Like e- everything seems to improve. Uh, I don't know if you would find something similar, maybe in a different context. I'm not sure, but uh, have you found, you know, limitations being helpful in your playing in your career? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that you just summed it up, basically, you know, like that, that was the whole, that was the whole reason that I started taking a, a small amp and like a fuzz pedal, if anything, to a gig. And then, you know, the thing that a lot of people don't get in this town, <clears throat> is that you don't you don't have to be in the most amazing situation to just play your ass off, you know? But it's something that took me a while to learn. Like I'm I'm really good at complaining when uh when I want to. I can find anything to complain about no matter the situation. <laughs> and uh yeah, I'm not bragging. <laughs> um, but you know, like you could be on a, you could be brand new to town and you've got your eyes set on, I want to be on a session with, you know, Dan Huff or, or whatever producer. And, and you're playing some gig for 150 bucks with someone who sings kind of pitchy and the drummers maybe doesn't have the tightest pocket. And man, you'd be nice if the bass player would tune between songs. Cause you can tell that it's a little out. You can find all these negative things to focus on, but at the end of the day, the only thing you can control is what you do. And you can still choose to set yourself up in a way to inspire yourself. And for me, live, it's exactly what you're talking about. Like, eliminate the board. Let's crank the amp and let's go out for blood. You know, like I want, I want everybody to know that I've practiced and I'm I'm playing my ass off, regardless of what else is happening on stage. I'm doing the right thing for my spot. And that's what I can control. So that's what I'm going to give 150% to. And man, I tell you, like early on when I was doing a bunch of live gigs, like people would come up to me right after and they're like, hey, I don't know you. You sounded great. Can I get your phone number? You know? And I thought, oh man, this is happening so fast. This is amazing. It still happens a lot slower than you want it to from where you start to where you, where you want to be, you set these goals. And I still think that's a good thing, you know, that it happens more slowly. You don't, you don't want to be really green and get in a room with, with somebody who, you know, could, could start calling you all the time. Like if, if you can only, you only get one chance at a first impression, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm. And so things happened a lot slower than, than I wanted them to, but, um, they did happen. And and I think a lot of it was me worrying about the stuff I can worry about. And I think what you're really talking about is being being able to get more out of yourself, switching things up because you know you're getting a little bit stale for your own ear. Exactly. So let's change what's at our feet. Let's change, like I would take a strat to a rock session, you know, 
with a single coil in the bridge. <laughs> and <laughs> what do you got to do? Well, I probably need to roll the tone back a little bit. I probably need to pick a little farther away from the bridge. I probably need to set the amp differently. Like I'm not going to, it's not going to sound just like a Les Paul, but I can get a big sound out of it by all these subtle adjustments, you know? And I think that's the same sort of thing. Like you, you reduce your options it changes how you play. You hear new things out of yourself. You get inspired, and that translates to other Beautiful. people who are listening. I have a I have a million and one questions for you, and I know the the other guys do as well. This could go for hours. Um, but before we keep moving, uh, Mason, do you want to do a couple? Of yes, ads? I would like to speak to you about a few sponsors, uh, listeners, for. Uh, that all make this podcast possible. The first of which is our, our friends over at the Guitar Sanctuary. And as you know, Brian O'Million loves the Guitar Sanctuary so much, he's actually there right now building pedal boards. And if you're interested in having a rig built by an industry professional, uh, Brian O'Million could be that guy. And at the Guitar Sanctuary, they are one of the premier dealers of pedals, pedal boards amps, guitars, all the things that you need are available there, and Brian can assemble them all for you on a beautiful pedal board exactly the way that you want it. So check them out over at guitarsanctuary.com over in McKinney, Texas. Tell Brian the chairman sent you. Also, our friends over at Sweetwater and their amazing new program, The Gear Exchange. This is a used buying and selling community that Sweetwater has created and the very cool thing that I think really differentiates it from other places like Reverb or eBay is if you sell on the Sweetwater Gear Exchange, you don't have to pay any fees. That's right, zero fees, so long as you decide to take your earnings and put them onto a Sweetwater gift card. You can use it as a glorified layaway program, sell the gear that you're not using, save up, and redeem that gift card for something at Sweetwater that you do want. Check it out at sweetwater.com slash used. And lastly, our friends over at Mono Creators. What I would say is probably the best gig bag in the business. Our friends over at Mono make all sorts of things from gig bags to pedal boards to various accessories, including their newly released power supply. And they're offering our listeners a special discount code. Using the discount code CHAIRMAN, C-H-A-I-R-M-E-N, you get 10% off your entire order over at monocreators.com. Go over there, check it out, use it to buy a gig bag, use it to buy a pedal board or any sort of pedal board accessories, and you won't regret it. Let's get back to the podcast and back to Justin. So Justin, we've talked a bit about pedals and pedal boards. You've talked a little bit about your amps of choice, very Mike Campbell influence. And interestingly enough, I don't think Mike Campbell gets enough credit for the session work that he did separately from any of the things that he did with Tom Petty. And, and if, you, if you're confused about the, the session work, you should listen to pretty much any of the Danny Korchmar produced Don Henley stuff. Uh, he's all over that. The, the Wallflowers, uh, <clears throat> that album that was in maybe 96, I forget the, the name of it, but he's all over that too. And, uh, and he's a really amazing <laughs> session guitar player as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. He just the king of playing the absolute right thing. Like you hear his parts on songs and you can't imagine anything else. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. Yeah. He's 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 incredible. Now, if we were to, to migrate to a similar line of questioning uh, around guitars, um, I'm always filling out my guitar collection uh, because I fantasize about being a session man, but my only audience is, is the people that are, are willing to endure my guitar playing on YouTube. Um, but I always feel like I'm adding different flavors here, imagining that I'm the session musician in my own world. If you were to say to somebody sort of staple guitars that you feel like you need, now I know you've said that you've just shown up to rock, you know, sessions with the Strat, but if you were to say you were going to have the guitar boat and you have five guitars that can fit in it, and you want to be in the Nashville session scene, what are the five guitars you feel like need to be in there to sort of cover the gamut 
of sounds that you might be requested to, let's say, invoke as part of the the, the session and, and the song. Okay, so I have to I have to constrain myself to five. Yeah, this is this is this is yeah. We're reducing our <laughs> options to be more creative. Okay, Here we go. yeah, and, and we'll we'll, we'll separate there. acoustic for this, you know, because because obviously that's going to be a different thing. We'll, we'll restrict it to five electric guitars. Let's say that. Right. Okay. So um, right off the top of my head, I think you have to have a Telecaster. Um, you know, for a while there, we sort of got away from them. You know, in the in the early two thousands. In the 2010s, it was more about um, a Les Paul or an SG into, you know, a Marshall or like an 18 watt, you know, or whatever. Um, we are far enough away from 90s country that it's come back around, and so those those sorts of tones. And it, it, of course, it's got a modern twist. There's there's always the modern pop element to it, but being able to cop those sounds and that style of playing. Um, you have to have a telly. So Telecaster for sure. The second guitar um, that I would probably make sure I had is a 335. I just feel like it's it's one of the most versatile guitars out there for just having two pickups, you know, and it, it, it can be big like a Les Paul. It can cut like a telly. You can... You can sometimes get that smoky, throaty, almost strat sound out of the neck pickup. It's a little more articulate than like a Les Paul neck pickup can be often. Um, it just seems to fit in the mix really well. Sometimes it, you can make it soft and airy. You can you can make it aggressive. Uh, so Telly in a 335. Um, sometimes, like I had a session last night, uh, and I took I took a Telly, a 335, and my Novo. And that is a sort of modern twist on a jazz master. I would say a jazz master is really, really effective right now, especially with the sort of cleanish, almost um, garage tone, clean parts, like sort of driving, like pop stuff, you know? It's, it, it's not gorgeous sounding, but it's the right kind of grungy and, and almost sort of ugly cleans. Like, like a jazz master middle position, a little bit of compression, you know, a little bit of reverb. Um, I have a jazz master. I absolutely adore. Um, it's a, it's a Danacaster. People have seen that a lot on my channel. I'll take, sometimes I'll take that and the Novo. Um, the Novo has a little more aggressive sound. It has P90s in it. There's a little more bark to it. Um, and it, it is about the most comfortable guitar I've ever played. Uh, they're they're doing really cool stuff, you know. I, I think it's worth the price of admission, and they they're they're modern classics to me. So those three, um, man, there's nothing like a Les Paul <laughs> as far as just that Kerrang, you know. <laughs> and a really good Les Paul, you can get a lot of good sounds out of. Um, so maybe you, that would be number four. Do you think that like the custom versus just like a Les Paul standard is a is a perceptible difference in a mix or you know because I saw that you had gotten uh or you, that sixty nine custom. I have a seventy four. It's and it's <laughs> it's surprising the lightest seventy four you'll ever find. It's eight really? pounds and three ounces. Whoa! Not chambered or anything, you know. Really? Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. I, I have Eight never played light. for a less light for a, yeah, less for a custom, custom from that era. Yeah. Dude, yeah. they're mostly That's ten true. plus. Weren't That's they true. made out of uh weren't they made out of just pure steel for a while? The, <laughs> it feels, it feels like balls. it. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. one of the sandwich <laughs> layers. <laughs> <laughs> oh my man. gosh. Yeah. Just like so, mom used to make, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my main Les Paul is a custom. I have two Les Pauls that are, that are not the standard thing. They're not a, they're not a Les Paul standard with humbuckers. They're, I've got a custom with, with humbuckers. And then I have a, uh, a gold top with a wrap tail and P90s. And they both do that Krang thing. You know, the gold top sounds like just a massive telly, you know? Um, ah, man, I don't know. 
Sometimes I have a hard time deciding what to take. I've, I've spent such a long time amassing a bunch of keepers, you know? Yeah. And so I'm like, which one do I want to take? And sometimes it comes down to what's got the freshest strings. <laughs> 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 I want something with single coils. I want something with humbuckers, you know? I haven't played that in a while. You know, this this kid's feeling like he hasn't got much attention. Let's yeah. Let's take him <laughs> okay. to work. So, th- so those and a strat probably or a baritone. I'm I'm it's hard for me to have five guitars and one of them not be a baritone. But I right. I will retune down to baritone levels if I don't actually have one with me. So let's say uh this guitar boat that Mason is talking about is starting to sink and you have to take <laughs> one of them. What's your one oh. guitar? If you had to encapsulate everything we just chatted about, you you can say one guitar for a session, and that's going to be the session guitar for the next year. Which guitar do you grab? Wow, for the next year. Okay, so this has nothing to do with what their values are and what I have invested no, into each usability. instrument. <laughs> usability. Let's go for that. Okay, okay. Um, man, it might have to be my jazz master, that Dano jazz master. Really? And that, and that to has be honest with you, in it? Or no, is it, it doesn't. It's got it's got Jazzmaster pickups. Um, okay. Here, I'll 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 get it out. I'll I'll play it for you all and just show you some of the sounds that I can get out of it because I feel like I feel like I can do I can do the the sort of snarly telly stuff out of it. I can get great neck pickup tones out of it. It responds well to rolling the volume off, um, and there. This is the guitar. A bunch, a bunch of players in town, we talk about if we could have a set of guitars where we got one from each session guy. Everybody says, hands down, the one they'd take from me is my jazz master. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they'd take Tom's um, Burst, obviously, Rob McNelly's 55 Telly, or his Strat. And Rob's got a bunch of amazing guitars. Uh, oh, man, I'm, I'm going to... I think Derek's SG, um, Kenny Greenberg's, uh, oh, maybe his, his Duesenberg with the palm bender. Anyway, let me grab this. Mm. And I've, I've got this, uh, I've got this properly routed through the audio. So, so our listeners will hear what they hear on my channel Yeah, as well. You actually, I think right now, while you're tuning, this is the first live audio we have ever had on the podcast. I don't want to put you of, in, of you know, guitar. Yeah. Of, of guitar. guitar, of any undue pressure here. Uh, you know, I know you're a bit unfamiliar with playing live and playing in front of people, but uh, just wanted to put that out there. Yeah. So that's neck pickup. Well, I, th- I think, Justin, because um, the audio that might be selected is still on your AirPods, I think it's not getting whatever's coming through your interface. And so we, we, just see, we see you playing, but we yeah. don't hear anything. You're looking <laughs> okay, good. Okay, okay. You look so, great. <laughs> but, but I'm recording all my audio, yeah. and when people hear it, they'll, they'll hear it. Yeah, okay. we'll, we'll 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 make sure that all the audio is properly synchronized. But if you if you see don't ah. see any response from us, it's because yeah, <laughs> yeah. just yeah. describe okay. to us what you're hearing, and then we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah. We'll just I'm go try with to all of our minds my blown. Chair. Yeah, we'll just yeah. <laughs> it looks like it sounds great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for your listeners, um, like this is a pretty gnarly. <laughs> And I don't know, it's like, it's big, it's aggressive. Um, I can still get a lot of the... And I need to tune again. But I I feel like I can can approximate a telly on the bridge pickup. I can approximate um, at least a P90 Les Paul. And then I can also... um, I can also get some of these, like, really, I don't know, cleanish R&B sort of, um... (laughs) 
like I can do Strat stuff on it. It speaks well with Slide. Um, for whatever reason, this guitar and me get along really well, and I feel like I can do about anything on it. So, so you can, that would you can be do your Steve one... Cropper licks if you need them. Oh yeah, yeah. Maybe not that bright. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pick real close to the bridge. <laughs> If you want to, if you want to play some Sam and Dave. So anyway, and what are you I'll, using uh, for? Uh, what are you using for an amp right now? Is this a mic'd up amp or is this a amp synth? It is. Yeah, it's my Sarge. Um, kind of, it, it's kind of my home base for home recording. Awesome. Um, it's a <laughs> for people who aren't familiar with analog outfitters. It's an amp built out of the chassis of a Hammond A100. And I think the circuit is like a 5E3, mm -hmm. but it has EL84s, mm -hmm. and it has the massive iron of a, of a Hammond. It's a, it's a heavy little amp, but it breaks up real early. I just, I don't have an ISO box in my garage. I'm, I'm at a, I have a very small garage, and the space is a premium in there, and so I just don't have the room to build, like, the sort of ISO box I had at my old house in my old studio. So I prefer to use amps that, that give up the goods at low volumes at home. Mm -hmm. And it's just sort of home base. All of my guitars sound like themselves through it. Um, it doesn't take over in any way. All, all my pedals, everything, the way I push the front end of the amp is really pleasing to me. Speaking of that, where you're talking about, you know, space and stuff with studios do you ever utilize like those load box like oxbox amp into those oxbox things that do those direct in recording options absolutely yeah, yeah. i have an ox um i have a two notes torpedo uh i have a rev d20 and i actually have a uh i actually have a black star 100 water um that I am really impressed with for being like a thousand dollar amp. It sounds really good. And it, it fits that gap in my arsenal, I guess. Like I, I, yeah. I don't have a, a extremely punchy hundred water that's capable of high gain. And that, that amp like the rev has its own cab modeling and I can go direct with it and just crank the snot out of it. And yeah, you know, that stuff's catching up. As long as there's a as long as there's a tube pre and power yeah. amp happening, I don't mind the modeling happening after that. You know. Yeah. If there's if there's real electrons going around on yeah. in tubes, I very cool. I'm okay with modeling the cab and all that. It's the mm. science. It's all about the science. Electrons. Tubes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I like that. I actually I have a question for you about uh, the importance of home studio rigs and gear that you'd want to use if if you're wanting to get like let's say someone like myself is wanting to get into this world. Before I get there though, I want to finish off with our last two sponsors, if that's okay. Um, I want to tell you guys about two of them. The first one being Bestronics at BTPA.com. This is the place you need to go if you need pedal board accessories, cable, looms, plugs, anything you need to finish off your board. Brad at BTPA is going to help you out. So check them out, btpa.com. Use the code DACHAIRS, D-A-C-H-A-I-R-S, to get 10% off or 90% away from free on your order. And uh, tell Brad the chairman sent you. I also want to tell you about Stringjoy, which I believe is local to you over there, Justin. Stringjoy makes right. uh, incredible USA-made strings from vintage specs to modern, coded or uncoded uh, Stringjoy has you covered at stringjoy.com. They also have a subscription service if you want to get them sent regularly in packs or you can just buy a single pack as well. The coupon code BOARDS, B-O-A-R-D-S, will work for any of the above options. So check them out at stringjoy.com. So uh, Justin, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, uh, you know, for our listeners, I feel like even for, you know, all of us starting our own businesses, I feel like it is a huge risk or when you're at the beginning of this. So when you were, you know, I think in 2006, you mentioned you moved to Nashville yeah. and I don't know if that's when the full-time career started. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but whenever the move was like, 
I am now, I'm going for it. I'm going to go full time. I'm going all in on this thing. You know, you, you take a big risk in doing that step. And I'm curious with that step, how important is it to be able to do this, you know, record sessions, record extra tracks um, at home? And if so, what is similar to the guitar boat of five guitars? What would be your essential starter kit for being able to record at home if you feel like that's an important step in this process? Yeah, so if that's your goal, to to make money recording guitar for other people, you need to start doing that as soon as you can. You need to start figuring out how to mic a speaker, how to get good sounds. You need to start learning what it sounds like to have a 57 right on the cone of a speaker versus playing live and having a combo amp at your knees blowing past blowing blowing past your legs, you know, not pointed right at your head. Like it, it's a wildly different um sound, you know. And you need to you need to learn how to play under the microscope of having having a, a you know a, a 57 and a Royer like that close to your to your uh, speaker cab or whatever. And so for me, um at my old house I had a detached one car garage and I spent a bunch of money converting that into a studio. And it wasn't so that I could, I, I, I knew that I was never going to make back what I invested <laughs> in building this thing out. But the goal was for me to have a space and I had a big ISO room. I had multiple layers of drywall. I had them decoupled with green glue. I had base traps. I had um, all sorts of treatment in the room. Um, it was a cinder block building. I dropped the ceilings. I did all this stuff to where I could, I could crank my basement into a 212 or 412 in that garage. And you could kind of hear it if you were in my backyard, but it, it didn't disturb anybody. So I could be out there, you know, just experimenting with sounds for hours and hours. And so I, I would, Nashville's a Pro Tools town. So I would, Pro Tools would be one thing. Um, an Apollo twin, you know, I think will get everybody up and running. And then, you know, if you want to um, splurge on a, on a real preamp, that's cool, but you can use plugins. Some of the, some of the Apollo stuff is pretty great. Like get a, get a bundle of them and see what you think sounds good. And then start getting as good of sounds as you can, you know, on the mic, learn what the levels are of your preamp versus how hot the amp is versus how hard you're playing and just start recording. And, you know, for me, when I, when I made the transition to get off the road and start recording, I just, I just told people, Hey, I do sessions now. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I would have like one or two a month, maybe, you know, but I would make sure that I went over and above and just really like somebody would call me to to do a $50 overdub and they had they had you know worked with a band on a session for their songs and it's not that somebody played something wrong on the session you you can't think of it that way it's just that sometimes things move so quickly in Nashville that it's not until after that writer or artist or producer sits with the tracks that they think man I wonder if if this could be different. I wonder if we could get something like this. And so that's how I sort of started getting my first gigs is I had some friends who were engineers and I said, Hey, I will, I will help, you know, quote unquote fix. Like there's nothing wrong with what's there, but maybe they want to try something else. And they're not in the studio anymore with that band. Like I will do that in a very budget friendly fashion. I will do whatever it takes to make it sound right. And that started translating to Let's just get him on the session in the first place, you know? Um, so I would say a MacBook Pro Tools, an Apollo Twin, you know, some of the new Princeton reverbs that Fender's putting out sound really great. <laughs> get a 57 and a mic cable, you know? And if, you're, if you don't have a place where you can isolate your cabinet, then, you know, in order to not color what you're hearing, wear these. These are like shooting range earmuffs, you know, or construction site earmuffs that you get for 20 bucks from Home Depot. They're made by Peltor. But this guy 
GK music. I feel like I'm spreading the gospel of GK music ultraphones all the time. I don't have any sort of deal with them. I pay full price, but these allow me to sit in extremely loud environments without hurting my ears. I listen ultra quietly because every guy and girl who has been a session player in Nashville, who's in the generations before me, they almost all of them suffer from tinnitus. Some of in a debilitating way. Like I, I'm not going to name any names, but I see some guys who have been playing sessions in Nashville for 30 years or so. Like they're they're watching my lips when I talk because they can't hear what I'm saying. They're they're trying to read my lips, and I hear them take their cans off, and I'm still sitting out on the floor trying to play a solo or something. And their cans are so loud, it's distorting. And it's like, they have to do that just to be able to do their job. And then Mm. they can't sleep at night because they have debilitating tinnitus, you know? And so those headphones allow me to listen so quietly. Like, I'm terrified of tinnitus. And, you know, I, I can sit next to a drum kit and the ride cymbal, like he can be just wearing that thing out. And then when he's not playing or when he's doing a percussion pass and I'm playing my second guitar pass, I don't have to change any of the levels in my cue box at all because I'm so well isolated. The hard thing about them is that they kind of squeeze your head and they make you sweaty and they can get a little bit gross and you got to clean off the pads, you know? But man, I'll take it to be able to go to sleep at night without just, you know, in my ears, you know? So no, well, would, I'm going to check those out. I'll, I'll put them in the in the description too if people want to check those out. Yeah, and I I have no affiliation with them other than I just they save my ears and that's that's why I use them. So if you're yeah. if you're recording at home with a few little things and a combo amp and you want to hear what's actually going on, you have to isolate. You know. Yeah. So. Well, Justin, I know that you you have to run here in, in a few minutes, and I just wanted yeah. to uh, to thank you for indulging our questions about the Nashville session scene, the gear as far as pedals, pedal boards, amplifiers, and guitars. I hope that for anybody that is considering coming to Nashville, and it seems like there are, you know, a, just a, a slew of people that move there every day. I know that there was some crazy statistic for a long time about how many new residents Nashville was absorbing on a daily basis, uh, that they have maybe a little bit clearer idea of some of the, the, the tools that they mean, may need uh, as they start to uh, hone their craft as a Nashville guitar player. But uh, I, I'm super appreciative of you coming on. If for all of you who are listening, please do check out the show notes in the description uh, to see Justin's channel. And he's just a great resource to have. And uh, you get to hear some amazing guitar playing on top of that, which is a bonus. And uh, thank you for uh, th- all that you do and, and uh, you know making a, an impact on, on the music that a lot of us listen to by way of your guitar tones and, and your tasty note choices. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this was very cool. Thanks, Thanks, Justin. Yeah. Well, until next time, uh, for all of you listeners, we will uh, see you a little further down the road to Tone Town. Hopefully one day we get to to our destination. But, you know, (laughs) as they say, it's uh, about the journey and not the destination. So with that, we will leave you for today. See you later. All right. See ya. Yeah.